Okay, I'd like to just uh, preface uh, what I'm going to say today with uh, just a couple of comments. When uh, Karen asked me to uh, do this, she said she wanted a formal presentation, which is in contrast to a more casual conversation that you've been experiencing yesterday and today. So I am going to be using a text and uh, partly so that I don't forget anything. And secondly, I want to apologize for any of you who have heard me many times before and have read uh, Envisioning Writing and I'm chapter five in Creating Meaning. Um, so, <laughs> and I've combined some of the material from both of those texts uh, for you today, but uh, I think I want to just point out that as educators, we do know that repetition is not necessarily a bad thing. So if you're hearing something again, maybe it's something that you just may put on the back burner and haven't thought about it for a while, and hopefully it will remind you. Um, my story, um, much of what I am presenting to you today is from Envisioning Writing, and I want to just point out that um, this research took place many, the beginnings of this research took place many years ago uh, in the mid-70s in Brookline, Massachusetts, when David Baker was my art supervisor, and I was an elementary art teacher. So the connections among the people that are here yesterday and today are a little insidious, I guess. The, the, the connections go back many, many years. So David, this is going to be um, uh, old hat to you as well, and maybe bringing up some memories. Okay. <laughs> Um, I have a, a couple questions of you first. How many of you, now I'm assuming you're all artists, how many of you consider your art narrative? Okay. Does your art have anything to do with your personal story? your narrative, your life? Are the hands going up more? Okay. If, um, think about how your art relates to narrative. And I suspect there are also some of you who are thinking right now, well, my art doesn't really connect to story. How many of you feel that way? Anybody? Yeah. My art, it doesn't really relate to story. Uh, I'm going to ask you the same question at the end of my presentation to see if you've changed your mind. Not that you have to, but just for the sake of the argument. Uh, as we know, everyone has a story to tell. I uh, noticed in the New Yorker about a year ago, everybody here liked the New Yorker cartoons? There was one uh, that uh, resonated with me because it said, everyone has a story to tell, unfortunately. <laughs> but in fact, everyone has many stories to tell. It is simply part of being human. Although some believe storytelling is primarily a verbal exercise, I argue that stories are expressed most naturally with both visual and verbal languages. Historically, this was particularly the case during the Middle Ages when Bible stories and historical events were transmitted to illiterate parishioners through the use of their altar paintings, stained glass windows, tapestries, and monumental sculptures. To use both the image and the word to tell stories continues to be a powerful and effective practice throughout history. To
to communicate a range of personal experiences and insights to others. Whether storytellers draw their experiences on the wall of a cave, compose parables in order to transmit a moral lesson, share experiences with family members or friends around a dinner table, a campfire, or the office water cooler, whether they recall family events for their grandchildren, read bedtime stories, look through a family photo album, share events or insights with strangers via, via the internet, volunteer to participate on a radio or television talk show, or are called as a witness in a court of law. Everyone has a story to tell. Stories will always be an integral part of our lives. They are part of our natural language ability and they are an important and effective means of communication, both visual and verbal. Stories are critical to our humanity. The arts have played an important role in the preservation of our stories, literature, poetry, theater, music, dance, and the visual arts have been the primary means of preserving our history and our stories for all to share and for all to gain insight and understanding from. And understanding from. Throughout time and across all cultures, stories preserve human experiences in the most unique and personal way. Life is composed of a complex design of characters, settings, props, special effects, and plots. As William Shakespeare so eloquently expressed when he wrote in his play, As You Like It, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. If human beings are natural storytellers, there must be a reason, a basic human need for this to be so. Anne Dyson explains in her research that children, like adults, use narratives to shape and reshape their lives, imagining what could have or should have happened as well as what did happen. Oops. Such as, the title of this is My Dog Shaking Water Off. <laughs> or, I Dreamt a Scary Lion Woke Me Up. A Day at the Beach. Bird's eye view, beach blankets and swimmers. My shopping trip to the mall. Is that clear? Okay. In teaching children to draw by Brent and Marjorie Wilson, they extend the discussion on the importance of story by stating that narrative becomes a means for the child to understand himself and the world with which we, he must cope, and that the child in his own stories is creating situations that are suited entirely to his own need and desire, that, that deal directly, though symbolically, with his own immediate concerns, such as in this drawing, think of the concerns this little boy was thinking about uh, in an imagined battle. Stories are therefore an important and effective way for people of all ages and of all cultures to order, reflect upon, and make sense of their life experiences. Stories help people to understand themselves to shed some light on the events of their life and their unique and special place in the world. Stories also help people to reflect upon their relationships with others and their responsibilities as citizens of the world community. Simply stated, stories help people to understand themselves and others. The retelling of their very own life experiences 
help people to understand the universal human condition and to be part of the universal human family. Although all people naturally engage in the act of storytelling, they often don't recognize their own experiences as, sufficiency, as, as sufficiently compelling or insightful enough to document or to share with others. I remember a number of years ago, an elderly woman participated in a poetry workshop offered by a nearby community center in New York City. For a number of sessions, she didn't think she had anything important to write about. Then one day, she brought in a sensitive and poignant drawing of a cockroach with an accompanying poem. When she was asked why she chose a cockroach as her subject, she simply explained that it was the only living creature that ever came to visit her. I never forgot her story. And notice that she expressed it both verbally and visually. I'm sorry I don't have a photograph of her drawing, unfortunately. It is my personal belief that one of the most important purposes of art is to tell a story. To tell one's story and to share one's interests and concerns, one's personal view of the world, one's joys and sorrows, to order, to touch the life of another. In my opinion, is the primary purpose of art. I argue that the vast majority of art relates to story, either in and of itself, or it relates in some way to the individual artist's life and is therefore a part of the artist's personal narrative. I will even go out on a limb and say that all art encompasses a story in one way or another. Even works that do not initially appear to be narrative in content can often be related to narrative if one is familiar with the life of the artist. For example, It is both interesting and somewhat surprising to learn that works by Mondrian, such as this work, Composition in White, Black, and Red, relates directly to the narrative of Mondrian's life. Bennett Schiff, former art editor for the Smithsonian Magazine, wrote a few years ago that in both Mondrian's life and in his art, he searched for peace, harmony, and balance. Mondrian held a deep philosophical belief that by employing mathematics, he could live in balance and harmony with the universe. Consequently, through his art, he tried to demonstrate visually that this harmony between the whole and its parts was possible. Mondrian was also a very good dancer and was particularly interested in American music rhythm and the popular dances of the time, including the two-step, the shimmy, and the boogie-woogie. The title of this painting, as many of you know, is Broadway, Boogie Woogie. Mondrian lived in New York City from 1940 until his death in 1944. Both of these paintings are examples of how works that appear to be non-objective are in fact narrative, and they are obviously an important part of Mondrian's personal story. Another poignant example of art expressing life's narrative can be found in the work of Willem de Kooning. His early and midlife work is filled with thick, powerful color and dramatic brushwork that it expresses an energetic and active view of life. As de Kooning progressively became the victim of Alzheimer's disease, his paintings gradually expressed the state of his mind. The empty, white, negative spaces became dramatically more prominent in his work, even to the point of becoming the dominant element 
This emphasis on the negatives reflect his own mental deterioration. These spaces are outlined with lines of thin color. During an interview recorded on videotape and presented at uh, a de Kooning exhibition a few years ago at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, de Kooning described his own, his most recent paintings himself, uh, before he was unable to explain his paintings. He explained that he retraces the lines of his compositions repeatedly, over and over again. This behavior is indicative of the Alzheimer patient. In an attempt to not get lost or to lose their grip on daily routine and reality, the victims of Alzheimer's disease repeat endlessly the simplest of daily tasks. De Kooning's final works were a powerful expression of his daily life, the personal story of being swallowed up by the empty negatives. I'm sure some of you have had the personal experience of losing a loved one to Alzheimer's disease. Isn't it amazing how de Kooning used his visual language to tell his personal story? The medical profession could actually learn a great deal from looking at de Kooning's paintings. They describe a personal journey, a personal story that few Alzheimer's victims are able to express. So, it becomes increasingly clear that the selected images, the favored elements, and or the forms of expression selected by individual artists are closely related to their personal narratives. I suspect that direct, direct con connections to one's life experiences could in fact be made rather easily in the case of each and every artist. Even artists whose work would not generally be categorized as narrative. It is simply human nature to investigate issues that are of personal concern or of particular relevance to one's own life. So, given this brief argument for including all art as narrative, allow me to ask my first question again. How many of you would describe your art as narrative? Those of you who do not think your art is narrative, let me ask you another question. Do you ever choose uh, a subject that has no interest by you at all? How do you choose your imagery? What is it that makes it interesting to you? There must be a human connection between your interests, your concerns, and what you choose to use in your artwork. That's how art connects to your story, your narrative even though it may not appear to be narrative in the traditional sense. It was about 30 years ago that the value of narrative in an art curriculum was first called to my attention by Brent and Marjorie Wilson and David Baker. Uh, David, as supervisor of my school district, invited Brent and Marjorie to come to Brookline to introduce to us uh, the value of narrative and their interest in their interest in children's drawings, children's story drawings. Uh, that was the beginning of my concern about story and it has continued, my fascination with it, my interest with it has continued until today and I'm sure we'll will continue. It just never stopped. The Wilsons posed two very specific questions. If simply asked to draw a story, what kind of a story would children, students draw? That was their particular research at the time. They collected a lot of examples, they analyzed the stories, put them into categories, and that research was published in School Arts Magazine probably in the late 70s. So if you want to search for that in the archives, I'm sure you can find it. 
Another question that was posed was if their narrative drawing vocabulary was expanded, would their stories become more detailed and more complex? Think of it in, in relationship to how children develop a verbal vocabulary. If children are, have a, an expansive verbal vocabulary, will they tell more complete stories, verbal stories, will they be become more detailed, more descriptive? I think most people know that a very large verbal vocabulary is essential. The same is true of a visual vocabulary. This was the question that was posed specifically to me because it was my school that was selected to investigate this particular question how to expand the visual vocabulary and would it make a difference in the kinds of stories and the degree of complexity in the children's drawings. Uh, Brent and Marjorie and I planned a program of drawing for an entire year to expand visual vocabulary and that's particularly what I'm going to share with you how to begin. Um, we designed this program to uh, cover grades 1 through 8. My school was an 8-4 system so 1 through 8 and from September until June. It seemed like a long time to spend on drawing I'll tell you what happened after that a uh, little bit later. But it, went, it, it wasn't a lot of time. I found that it could go on forever, actually. We began with characters. We be began with characters. Notice I'm calling them characters rather than figure studies or portraits. It's just a, a terminology that uh, puts it into a story more, mold a, a little bit more clearly and it also makes a nice connection to what's going on in language arts programs when they're um, talking about characters. Uh, I, we did the same lessons from grades one through eight, so I'm not necessarily going to tell you what grade this was because we did, we did the same thing to, uh, from grades one through eight. We started out by just asking the, the children how many different kinds of people can you name and we would go around the room as many times as necessary and they would name ballerina, policeman, fireman, nurse, teacher, and whatever, baseball player, whatever. And they found they could name many, 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 many people. And uh, it got them thinking about how many different kinds of people they really knew about. And then we talked about visual clues. You know, if you were draw drawing a uh, ballerina, for example, as this little girl did in the upper left, uh, what would the visual clues be so that uh, someone who hadn't seen the drawing before would know exactly what kind of a person uh, was being depicted? So we talked a little bit about the importance of putting in visual clues. And you see the nurse, and you see the fireman with the hose, and so on. So expanding how many different kinds of people can you draw? Expanding the vocabulary. I'll just show you a couple. This is a little bit faint, but those of you in the front can see that this little boy just loves sports. And he's got just about every sport, sporting event represented. And uh, even to, the one I love is in the lower left-hand corner with the jockey. And he even has two horses side by side, which he was, in, I will tell you, well, he was in second grade, so I mean, it was, quite extraordinary to me that he could put in so many visual clues. Animals, of course, are characters as well. And I did the same thing with, uh, with these characters. How many different kinds of animals can you name? Uh, what are the visual clues? Uh, I also had many um, resource materials in the classroom. So if they weren't sure uh, about maybe the texture of the fur of an animal or um, 
how the spots are on a giraffe or whatever. They could go to the resource material and solve their problems. So they were doing research as well. So this is how many different kinds of animals can you name? What would the visual clues be? How many can you draw? And I found many children would do many pages. They wouldn't just stop with filling in uh, one page. Fantasy creatures can be characters in stories. Um, how many different kinds of fantasy creatures can you draw? Making them up. This is a page of um, P uh, how many different kinds of people can you draw by a very young Pablo Picasso. So do artists really do this? Yes. They do. I'm not sure if the question was posed that way, but he obviously was uh, filling up a page with all kinds of characters. Once children uh, are confident that they can draw a lot of people, a lot of different kinds of people, uh, I suggested to them that they pick out a couple of their very favorites and bring them to life by experimenting with having them move. Uh, I should point out at this point, I never, ever showed them how to do it. Never. I, my strategy was to always pose questions to them. How would a hockey player move? Get up out of your seat and pretend you're the hockey player. Have your friend get up and do the the motion and you observe and you solve the problem. I wouldn't say it to them quite like that, but I posed the questions so that they would solve the problem. And again, I, uh, I sometimes, for some of the visual problems that I was presenting to them, I would have uh, reference material again that in some cases uh, they couldn't find the answer within the classroom. They would go to uh, a book to find out the answer. So this was a little first grade boy, by the way. I tell you that only because I think he did an extraordinary job of solving the problem of movement here. This is a ballet dancer. That is, that's not a baton, that's the ballet bar. <laughs> and of course the shape of the paper is important as far as getting movement, moving a, a character from the left to the right across the page. Oh, I had that in twice, I guess. What am I doing here? Okay, another example. And I had the children actually getting up and doing this. I mean, it, 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 it was uh, very important for them to, my room was a very long, narrow room and they could, had the space that they could do their cartwheels and so on. This is an example of how interested a child gets in movement. I mean, he, he really took the idea of movement and, and took many of his characters and, and, uh, and focused on movement. Okay. It's important that characters have feelings and emotions. So uh, starting with an initial drawing, uh, which is in the upper left-hand corner, uh, one of their people. Uh, they could also uh, draw themselves. This could be a self-portrait, but it didn't have to be. And uh, we talked about the various emotions, happiness, being sad, being surprised, being scared. We talked about how many different emotions people um, experience. And then they could, they could choose what they wanted to do. It wasn't dictated. So, and the reason I include it is to point out that, that artists really do this kind of expansion of their, their vocabulary. They really do, do the same kind of, uh, of uh, they pose the same problem for themselves. An elegant problem, right? <laughs> okay. Yes? No, I have to get away from I, uh, in the case of 
of the faces, that was simply taking one of their characters and make, making that one face express a variety of different emotions. But it could be as many emotions as they wanted. They, there was no, it wasn't, it wasn't dictated. Moving on to another story element, settings. Uh, talking about the weather, what happens to a particular place when it's raining. You know, watching weather reports is a good way for them to pay attention to how a place changes um, with, a, you know, if the weather's very, very windy, how do you draw the trees? Uh, what blows around? Do you see birds in the sky when it's uh, a hurricane, for example? This is their house, and this is setting as well. Uh, their house in the morning, at noon, and at night. How does your house change? How does the setting of your house change as the day progresses? And you'll notice, I mean, there's a lot of information here. Uh, the car is home in the evening. The car isn't home during the day. The stars come out, so on. This is a sequence of how a setting changes from uh, during the whole year. Uh, from left to right uh, is uh, spring summer, fall, continued, <laughs> winter. I'm sure you can think of many, many, many more ways of getting at setting. Don't, don't ever think that what I'm showing you is, is a limit on uh, each of these elements, story elements. Uh, special effects. Uh, during this time, we, we talked a lot about um, television and movies and how a director uses special effects to tell the story and getting them to notice that close-ups or uh, wide views uh, are used as a story element and not just for the sake of a special effect, but it usually has a special purpose. This was an exercise uh, where uh, a problem was divided into three parts. It was simply how do you draw a person who is far, 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 far away from you? How do you draw a person who is very, very close to you? And how do you draw a person who is walking away from you? Now, those were questions that were solved by the children themselves. And they used each other to get at the answer. Again, I mentioned that my room was very long, and uh, children would stand at the front of the room and someone would go to the back of the room and they'd say, how would you draw that person far, far away? How would you draw when the person's standing right in front of you? And the problem that I found the most fascinating is they would have a, a, a friend walk to the back of the room and then stop, you know, halfway, <laughs> freeze, freeze. And they'd study their feet and solve the problem themselves. This was just a little, little guy. I think he was in second grade as well. And he, he solved the problem himself. Okay, looking, again, special effects, more special effects. Uh, if you were a bug on the floor, what would a, how would you draw a tree? How would you draw a chair, uh, a door? If you were a fly on the, on the ceiling, how would you draw the tree? How would you draw the, um, door. Special effects, looking down, looking up. Remember, this was done grades one through eight, so you're seeing a lot of different uh, drawing ability here. Close-ups in a story, again, relating it to movies and, and uh, television. Coming closer coming closer. Of course, it can be the other way around, going, for, going further away, going further away. Okay. 
As I remember, the children particularly liked this. They thought it was like they had found the secret to a trick that they could make it look. And, and one child did this next. Oh, wait a minute. Hmm. I lost it. Oh, well. I thought I had one more sequence. I guess I didn't put it in. I apologize. Anyway, after special effects, then, uh, plots, the beginning of a plot. This is a beginning, a middle, and an end. Probably the shortest story, except again, I saw a cartoon in the New Yorker where it showed uh, someone sitting at a desk and they titled it Writer's Block. Once upon a time, they lived happily ever after. No middle, <laughs> no middle. This was done to music, um, and I think there must be all kinds of possibilities of uh, finding music where there is a distinctive uh, beginning, middle, and an end, um, and that children could make up the story that goes with the music. Uh, the music in this case was um, The Hall of the Green Mountain King by uh, Edvard Grieg from Pier Gint. I did not introduce them to the story that was the uh, inspiration for the music because I wanted them to come up with their own stories. I wanted them to think about what the music made them think of. So uh, there was a very, very slow plotting beginning, a very fast middle, and a loud crashing ending. And we talked about what this possibly could be, and it reinforced for them that stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And of course, they can be much longer, but this is the beginning. And of course, we, we did expand it. This is a little hard to see, but this is um, storyboards. Uh, it's always interesting for children to know that um, television programs and uh, many movies actually start with a storyboard and to plan it out. This was on very um, manila paper. You know how bad that is for photographing, but it, it was good practice paper. So a storyboard. This was a storyboard. Rep recognize the format, David? <laughs> This was David's design, actually. Uh, this was a little boy that was uh, did a, a story sequence about a little boy who planted a carrot. And a bunny came along and ate the carrot before he had a time to pick it. And he cried. And uh, it was sad. And then uh, the bunny comes back and he he uh, makes friends with him again, and they, they end up swinging together in the bottom picture there. <laughs> okay. Uh, remember the question. Um, the question was, will children uh, draw more complex stories? if their vocabulary is expanded and if they have more experience with narrative strategies um, for expanding their vocabulary. This is a very short little sequence of pictures that tells the story about the Pony Express. And uh, the subject of these stories was uh, chosen by the, by the children, by the students. Uh, this was a sixth grade little boy. And, um, I want you to particularly notice how many different kinds of narrative strategies he's included here. Um, movement of his characters, movement of the animals. I, he, he did look up horses in uh, books to see how, to, uh, how they moved. Uh, his characters are moving arms and so on. A close-up, a crucial close-up, so we don't n miss what's happening here. Again, movement of the figure, an appropriate setting. This was interesting to me because um, 
he, the little boy came to me and said, I want to draw a picture of a horse that's coming right at you. And so he posed the problem. And um, I, of course, I couldn't show him how to draw a horse coming right at me. I, I uh, wouldn't have known how to do that myself. So uh, I considered it a problem for him to solve. Uh, I sent him to the library to uh, ask the librarian for books on horses. He brought them back up to the room and he searched and found the answer to his problem. And then he could solve the problem himself. He also has, uh, uh, the setting is very um, well thought out and he has the third dimension represented here as well with other horses in the background. Split screen. <laughs> the end. It's very short, but there are um, many, many important elements in there that um, really do reflect the degree of uh, complexity that children are able to include in their drawings to tell their stories. Uh, without, without the expansion of the vocabulary, you know what would happen. For example, if you're writing a story, if you're writing a paper, what do you do when you're not sure how to spell a word and you don't have a dictionary or a spell check? What, you choose a different word. I mean, don't we all do that? Well, children do the same thing with their drawings. If they want, for example, if the little boy couldn't figure out how to draw a horse coming right at you, if he couldn't solve that problem, he would have changed his story to accommodate what he could know, could do. Um, some of you have maybe heard me make reference to Maurice Sendak where the wild things are. That was not the original title of his book. The original title of his book was Where the Wild Horses Are. He couldn't draw horses. He has, ex I, I have this explanation on tape. He found it very difficult to draw horses. So he changed his story to something that no one could criticize. I mean, who knows what a wild thing looks like? Because he could draw wild things. So, same with children. Um, although you notice that this narrative drawing program was um, all drawing from September to June, from grades one through eight, I don't want to leave you with the um, assumption that it's all about drawing, that story only has to do with drawing. Um, it became a natural way to think about curriculum. All else fit neatly and logically under that very large uh, inclusive umbrella. You could include studies of color and paint and media and techniques and everything all under the umbrella of, um, of story. So I want to give you uh, an indication of how this, after that year was over, story just continued. Uh, characters were developed in paint. Settings were developed in paint. We talked about monochromatic colors. Again. We moved into sculpture with characters. Lots of characters. I picked out just a couple. Paper mache sculptures. Again, characters. <laughs> I wonder what happened to that little boy. <laughs> puppetry, puppetry, 
it's a natural. I mean, they uh, students incorporated their skills on settings and props and characters, um, along with developing a story. Uh, these are wire sculptures uh, representing characters in Aesop's fables. So the Aesop's fables were brought to life. Um, you'll notice there's a turtle in the lower, the mouse. There's a hare and a fox and a wind and sun, I think, a, a rabbit. I just didn't want to leave you with the impression that to expand vocabulary is only drawing. Drawing is basic, of course. It's the place to start. But it doesn't limit what you can do with uh, other media. Uh, these were life-size uh, clay uh, heads that uh, expressed emotions. Um, you can see how large they are in relationship to the students. Almost in some cases, larger than life, actually. Uh, we did George Siegel type characters, uh, and they became characters in a play. This is a, uh, a play that was titled uh, Save Me a Place at Forest Lawn, I think. It's actually a comedy. <laughs> and uh, you notice we, we produced four large George Siegel type sculptures. We didn't have the, um, uh, the pleasure of having the length of time that Siegel had. We had to do this in uh, a sequence of days, fitting into the 50 minute uh, class period. So it was, they were done in, in sections and, and put together. These were, these, this was an eighth grade project. Um, after the Wilsons uh, left, after the first year, uh, they completed their work. Uh, the one piece that we had not originally included in our list of character settings, special effects, and, and plots was um, props, otherwise known in our field as still lifes, uh, taking individual objects and really studying them, like a piece of furniture or an apple, or a still life that's composed on a table, or whatever. But if you think about it, if you think about it in terms of a story, uh, like a stage set, uh, these objects become uh, props in a story, as this is. This is a prop. And this, of course, is a um, Big Mac. I can't remember how that goes, Martin. Do you remember with the sesame seeds and the that, that rhyme, do you know that? Say it. <laughs> Thank you. And it, during each step along the way, I, was cons I, I, I prepared the student for failure because, first of all, I wasn't sure it would survive being fired in the kiln, which it did, because it's solid, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not hollow. And then secondly, I, uh, I didn't think that the glazes would come out uh, realistically. So I prepared him that may maybe the, uh, the glazes would be a different color than he expected. But it all came out fine. <laughs> so um, this was um, a very, very important couple years where I was beginning to get the feeling for the importance of story. In, in art curriculum. As you know, what happened is I just continued on this path and in envisioning writing, I made not, I, the one chapter deals with the art program, but you know, uh, those of you who have been introduced to the book, uh, there's a chapter on language arts and this just makes a natural connection to writing and uh, it has just continued. And the use of the terminology, characters, settings, plots, um, props, is a way of making that natural connection to what is being uh, talked about in language arts. Instead of portraits and figure studies, I use the term characters. Instead of uh, landscapes and uh, seascapes and cityscapes, I say settings instead of um, 
props, as I mentioned, instead of still lifes and objects, I say props. It just makes that connection and it helps language arts teachers understand what you're doing. And they usually are quick to say, oh, you're doing the same thing I'm doing. I'd like to close with um, one painting by a little third grade boy of the sea. Uh, he lives in Massachusetts, so he has been at the beach many, many times. And I'd like to read the poem that he wrote after he painted his picture. Uh, part of the reason I want to read it to you is he's in third grade and listen to the sophistication of what he's thinking and what he's experiencing. Waves crashing against the surface of the beach. Smashing rocks create sand. Roaring waves create cold water and fishy smelling sea storms. The grayish sharp point of the waves are loud and dangerous. Somewhere out in the middle of the there might be far worse mysterious waves that are twice the size of the waves we know about. Now that's an image inspiring language. Partners, not subservient to, but equal partners, equal partners. Thank you. I couldn't quite put it in naturally, so I decided it would be the last thing that I tell you. Um, your professor, Dr. Joan Gaither, is the ultimate artistic storyteller. And if any of you have not seen what's going up and almost up, I mean, she is the epitome of using her art form to tell stories, and they're wonderful. And finally, how many of you use your art to tell your personal stories? <laughs> Can we pick up a few? Quite a few. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.